Hi, I'm Jen Sandoval, an Associate Professor of Communication at the University of Central Florida and a speaker, trainer, and consultant around communicating better across difference and difficulty. Today, I'm going to do a very brief introduction to inclusive language, or rather, Inclusive Language 101. What I want to focus on today is how much words matter. Language is our most complex system of symbols, and so it can be really difficult to make the most inclusive communicative choices, but it's important to think through how we are embracing and honoring all of the identities of folks that we work with, folks that we learn with, and communities that we wanna be engaged truly with. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about why inclusive language is important, how it operates, and then I'm going to go through some of the principles of inclusive language, including a few examples of what that looks like in practice. And finally, end with some action steps from low intervention decisions you can make today to larger organizational work that you can do. So first, it's important to recognize that inclusive language actually does the work of acknowledging the power of words acknowledging that they have power to lift up and also to cause harm. Inclusive language is gonna help us respect the differences that are present in all of our working and learning environments so that we can more effectively uh, create true environments of belonging. And finally, inclusive language works to honor the full dignity and personhood of folks. And there's a lot of confusion about how to do this really well. And that's why I want to talk for a few minutes about some of the principles to consider. Now, I do want to note that this is not a comprehensive list. Like I said, language is complex, it is nuanced, and it is dynamic. And so this is really just uh, the simplest way to start our work and to think about this together. And then I hope that you will think through what these principles look like in practice for your organization and also what principles you may need to add based on the context in which you work and the communities you work with. So first, it's very important to identify our own biases, whether that's based on the discipline or industry that we're in or simply through our own socialization and education. A lot of us have linguistic habits, and those are based on the environments we've been conditioned in. And that's not inherently negative, but if we ignore it and let those habits continue without critical reflection, there's a possibility for us to make graver mistakes. Once we've done some of that internal self-reflexive work, we want to start thinking through what this looks like. And a really important principle is self-identification. So we want to make sure that we're listening very carefully to how folks talk about themselves and then mirror that language back when we're in communication with them. People will make different choices. There's very little consensus about the best possible practice. I can't give you a list of what to say and what not to say in every single situation. And that's why uh, reflective and effective active listening is really important. And then honoring the choices that people are making about their own identity. We want to make sure that it's person centered, right? We want to avoid using disempowering language. We want to focus again on that notion of full personhood for all the folks that we're engaged with and make sure that we are thinking through the importance, how much difference matters and how much that is an important part of valuing diversity and of creating true sense of belonging in our learning and working spaces. We also always want to make sure we're taking into account that context, right? And so there may be certain things that are, are language in use for your industry that you have to think through very carefully. You want to make sure that you are reflecting back the language of the community that you're in and paying attention to those very different contextual and environmental cues. Context is a really critical factor in all of our communicative choices, but particularly when it comes to word choice around identity. We also want to consider identity salience. So oftentimes, those of us who do this work give kind of a blanket recommendation that terminology should be gender neutral. 
And that's likely true in a lot of circumstances, but there can be a very specific reason why gender identity uh, or even uh, biological sex or other categories in some um, realms, right, sex assigned at birth, can be important markers or identifiers. They do a lot of work in the healthcare community, particularly around reproductive and sexual health, right? And so we have to consider when identity is salient and also um, in reference to that context and salience, if we're quoting data, we have to quote the language of the source because it's going to mean something particular in the way that that was written. And we can't add meaning or take away meaning from that data. We also wanna ensure that we're naming oppression. And this means that our language should always be looking at um, the historical, structural, and systemic impacts on identity and language around that. What this means is that oftentimes, language uh, that is assigned to different identities has actually been determined by people with power and positionality and not by the group itself. And we can see this in a lot of disability advocacy by people who are reclaiming a lot of language that may uh, have been used against them in the past, right? So the notion of saying even person with a disability is not always um, how people want to identify, but rather reclaim the identity of being disabled and saying that it doesn't matter if you don't think this is the default or typical, this is a fully embodied uh, part of who I am and I'm claiming that, right? But we want to make sure that we're naming the perpetrators of oppression and that oppressive force when we're choosing language. So this can look very simply like using minoritized instead of minority. Minority reflects a diminishing of a community and makes it sound like it might even be a small community. And perhaps the ratio of folks in a particular location does make that demographically true, but overwhelmingly and overall, that can be a really problematic way to refer to groups. Minoritized reflects the history and the structures and the policies that have actually led to thinking about people in terms of numerical majority. And it reflects the fact that that was done to communities and not chosen by communities. We also want to be flexible. This is one of the biggest challenges. Language is dynamic and it changes and it changes pretty quickly. And people want to talk about this like it's a new phenomenon, but language has always been changing. And we want to make sure that we remain open to those changes because as understandings increase, new words will emerge to better describe the lived experience of folks. And the more agile we are, and the more that we remain flexible in changing our own linguistic habits, the more we're gonna be able to engage in fully inclusive communication. And finally, maybe most importantly, I always like to focus on the fact that impact is greater than intent. We're gonna screw up. Even people who are engaged in this work make mistakes. We have really old habits that are hard to break. When we make a mistake, it's important not to center our own feelings of guilt or shame about making a mistake or trying to just say, well, I didn't mean it that way. My intention was all the good intentions in the world can't make up for the harm that was likely done by that mistake. So repair that harm, make a commitment to move forward and make a change in the language or behavior that has caused harm. And that's the best way to respond to those errors. So what does this look like in practice? Well, I wanna go through a few examples. Again, not at all a comprehensive list, right? But one of the things that we focus on quite a bit is avoiding ableist language. And this has changed considerably over time. And it has added important language around mental health, and around a wide range of embodied and lived experiences across disability. So we wanna avoid words like crazy or normal or hands-on and think through what is it that we're actually trying to communicate. We wanna avoid using diagnoses as a way to describe just an everyday experience that we might have, not as a person with that diagnosis. 
for instance, people might say, oh, that's so OCD, right? What do you actually mean? Oh, that's such a, a rigid habit that I have, or it's my response to trying to control my environment. It's probably not crazy. Maybe you mean that it's unusual or different or wild or surprising. You probably don't necessarily need everything to be physically and literally hands-on. What you're trying to communicate is interactive approaches. So we have to increase our vocabulary and not rely on maybe some lazy choices in terms of how we talk about things. The second category that comes up quite a bit is the use of gendered language. And one of the biggest habits that we have across contexts, across regions, is the use of masculine generic words. We've gotten better in terms of positions or titles, things like chair or chairperson instead of chairman. However, one habit that is really difficult to break is the use of you guys. Everywhere I go in the United States, people say, well, it's regional, and we all know what it means. Well, it's not regional because it is something that happens in every region of the United States. And this is actually a great example of a little uh, cognitive trick that we can use to figure out whether the language that we're choosing is in fact as inclusive as we think it is. When we say you guys and we say, well, that means everyone and everyone knows that, if we used a feminine generic, would it be the same? So if we were to replace that with you gals, you girls, you ladies, will everyone in the room feel like we're speaking to them or will some people say, that's odd, it sounds like Jen's only speaking to women right now. If it's not reversible, it's probably not as inclusive as you think. And that question also relies on a binary, right? And doesn't allow any room for all of the various expressions across a non-binary or gender queer continuum. So that's something that we can work to eliminate right away. We also wanna think about whether or not spotlighting is salient, right? So highlighting the gender of a particular person or a role, we wanna ask those questions uh, through the principles that we apply to see if that is actually necessary or if it's a habit or if it's a habit because we tend to think of it as unusual, right? When somebody says, oh, a lady doctor, right? It's because the norm or the expectation is that there are not as many women physicians as there are men. And finally, a gender language practice that we can change is the incorporation of pronouns into lots of areas of our work, whether that's your business card, your email signature, your video call identity line, by making this a more typical practice, and particularly for cis folks, this can open up a way for it to become a standard in a lot of our communication exchanges. So trans folks or gender non-binary folks or people who may feel pressure to have to teach people their pronouns um, can start to see it incorporated in general. In the same way that 20 years ago, 15 years ago, when people would use the word partner, it was in terms of interpersonal or romantic relationships, people made an assumption about the nature of that relationship. But as more folks with um, heterosexual or straight privilege started to use it, it became ubiquitous. And then it wasn't an automatic outing of anybody who's describing their relationships. The last category is com as complex as the others, uh, and this quick introduction is certainly not going to get into enough of the nuance, but just to make sure um, that we have some shared vocabulary. For a while now, a lot of spaces have used the terminology people of color, which can be a really effective large group uh, in order to identify the difference in experiences, particularly in the United States, but in lots of other locations as well, for non-white folks. For um, years now, uh, people in activist spaces and in race studies have been using BIPOC, but here in the summer of 2020, a lot more of the general public has seen this uh, reflected in the coverage of some really important activist movements and events. There's a little bit of disagreement about what it stands for. Some people use it as Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And some people say it references Black and Indigenous people of color. In my corner of the work, I've typically used it and seen it used to reference Black, Indigenous, and people of color to 
acknowledge and recognize the very specific difference in the history in the United States for Black and Indigenous people. That this um, unique oppression of slavery, of colonization, of genocide makes that experience and the structural impacts a lot different and should be identified outside of a monolith of people of color. Latinx, Hispanic, and Latino is another example of something where you're gonna have to pay attention to context, community, and self-identification. If you're unsure about the difference, Latino is traditionally used to describe people with heritage or origins in Latin America. So Mexico, Central America, South America. And that is because it differs from the term Hispanic, which is another constructed term in the United States to try to describe a demographic shift that people didn't know how to identify that was based on the use of Spanish language. And so Hispanic would not include a lot of our siblings in the Caribbean, some island nations, um, certainly some countries in South America where there are languages that are not Spanish. And of course, Spanish is the language of the colonizers. It is not the indigenous language of people from those regions. And then Latino tends to be um, less used for younger folks. So there's a big generational divide because it is a masculine generic, which is a challenge in the Spanish language in general. But Latinx is meant to be more expansive in terms of honoring all gender identities and avoiding that masculine generic. Again, no agreement or consensus across every area of our communities. So pay attention to community and self-ID. And then the word indigenous uh, has not always been a term in use at the same level that it has been now, although it is a very important way to honor the real history of a place like the United States. So here in Orlando, where I'm located, we are working and living on the occupied land of the Seminole and Timucua people. And it's really important to acknowledge the difference of that experience and to recognize um, the people who have always inhabited this particular land and then have experienced specific oppression because of colonization and genocide. All right, that's a lot of information in a short amount of time and still barely scratches the surface of what we can do about this. But there are some very specific things you can do from small habit changes to large structural changes for action. I encourage everyone to pick one thing to change in your own communicative choices right now. Don't try to change every language use or bad habit that you have. It will be very difficult to overcome and you'll give up very easily. Maybe it's just that you are gonna eliminate you guys from your lexicon. And a great way to do that is to get an accountability partner, somebody who can pay attention to your speaking or your writing so that they can catch you and call you out, right? And maybe um, you can gamify it a little bit, you can keep track or score or you know, pay a small amount of money or make a donation if you make any really big mistakes. Larger work that you can do is to start constructing inclusion or equity guides for your organization. This is a living document that should be managed uh, carefully, thoughtfully, and intentionally with a lot of uh, updates, but can look specifically at your location, the community that you're in, the communities that you serve, and look for what is better practice right now in ensuring that you're using the most inclusive language in every space possible. And then finally, don't stop learning. This takes practice. It's part of our own personal and institutional growth. And so don't be too hard on yourself if you don't get it right uh, immediately. We have to show some grace to ourselves and to each other as we participate in the learning and unlearning of these habits. I hope that's given you a few valuable tidbits about uh, some changes that you can start to make and maybe a little bit of information about why those changes are so important. If you have further questions, please feel free to reach out to me at jennifer.sandoval at gmail.com. I look forward to being your partner in this learning and unlearning.
I hope that you will carry this change forward in all of your working and learning spaces. Thank you so much for your time. Be well.